All right, good evening, everyone. My pleasure to uh, introduce our lecturer this evening, uh, David Levin, uh, principal of Levin Betts, which is an award-winning New York City-based architecture practice. The office was founded by David Levin and Stella Betts in 1997 and focuses on design at all scales, including urban design, public architecture, houses, and housing, um, commercial workspaces, exhibitions, and furniture. The office employs a variety of methods to arrive at innovative solutions within the programs and sites of architecture central to their work is the idea of architecture that engages its urban and other natural environment. Levin Betts' work has been recognized nationally and internationally through awards, exhibitions, and publications. The office has won six New York City AIA awards. Um, the office has recently been awarded a project for a 300,000 square foot commercial building in Harlem through the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, Levin Betts was selected as the Architectural League of New York for 2009 Emerging Voices series, the Architectural Records 2007 Design Vanguard, and a 2003 Young Architects Forum. More, moreover, the office's work has been exhibited internationally in New York, Berlin, Seoul, China, Washington, D.C., and the Center for Architecture in Manhattan. A monograph of the first 10 years of the office's work called Pattern Recognition was published in 2009 by Princeton Architectural Press. Uh, my practice was fortunate enough to be selected as one of five with Levin Betts uh, to contribute to the Architecture at Home exhibition at the Crystal Bridges Museum, and this is how I got to know David and Stella uh, through, that, through that process, and I also found out that David is an avid cyclist, as am I, so he and I rode uh, three and a half hours, 57 miles yesterday, we rode up to 7,500 feet, uh, used the last of the oxygen he had in his lungs, uh, to get to the top, um, and so I had the pleasure of, of doing that, and um, very happy about it. Yeah, he's still alive, still alive. Um, he wanted to go. He wanted to climb Sandia, but I said it's there's still snow up at the top, so uh, we we did that instead. But um, our lecture is generously supported by the John Gall Meme Foundation. Um, so please join me in welcoming David Levin. Thanks, everybody. The, the way I stood up belied how my legs actually feel right now. Um, I want to thank, uh, first, I want to thank all of you for coming uh, to this evening uh, to the talk. Um, I want to thank uh, Rachel Jump, who uh, helped get me out here um, and uh, helped advertise this lecture. And then, of course, at the last minute, made all of this technology happen. Um, I want to thank Dean Robert Gonzalez uh, and his. Uh, as Chris said, the, uh, the John Gall meme endowment who supported the lecture. And of course, I wanna thank Chris, um, who is a, uh, a, a new friend uh, through this, uh, this process at Crystal Bridges and uh, with whom uh, Stella and I are having a very interesting conversations about the discipline, um, which we'll maybe expand on later. Um, but I want to start the, the talk this evening with this image, um, which is called, it's a photograph from 1968, and it's called Earthrise. Uh, and in our image-laden culture, and of course with technological advances like in the Hubble telescope and the James Webb, you know, this doesn't look like much. Um, but it's significant because in 1968, the astronauts from the Apollo 8 mission saw the Earth rising from their position on the moon and scrambled for their cameras. And it's the first image where humans saw their home against the emptiness of the universe. So this sense of fragility uh, and this sense of needing to um, understand how to adapt and live on our home uh, became sort of part of this, uh, this public consciousness. Um, kind of, many people say it was the beginning of the current environmental movement. I think there are a lot of other strains going on. Um, but the image is significant in that way. And I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about astronomy tonight. I'm going to talk about what this fragility and this sense of living on the planet and adapting to our, uh, our you know, our condition here uh, means. Um, so this term adaptation, I want to just start with the de definition. I love this, the, the, the biological um, uh, definition, which is the, uh, a change or the process of change by which an organism or species becomes better suited to its environment. 
And with our environment, meaning our climatic environment, our social environment, our institutional environments changing rapidly in our cultures right now, this sense of, of becoming better suited to our environment uh, is critically important to the practice of architecture, I would argue. Um, I also love this quote from art, the art critic Jerry Saltz. Um, he says that Darwin's assert assertion was not survival of the strongest, but survival of those that are able to adapt. So I think the key terms here are adapt, but how about survival? Um, you know, we're, we're watching the climate change rapidly and our, our discipline uh, is responding, perhaps not responding fast enough, but has to consider how it responds. Um, before I get into the, the theme, which is adaptation, I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of our, our practice. Uh, Levin Betts, uh, I'm Levin, Stella's Betts, we've elided our names. Um, our practice runs, as Chris said, from many different scales. This is the all the soon to be completed, actually it's more completed than this now, uh, image from this 300,000 square foot life sciences uh, building in Harlem uh, that we're completing. And it's a new building, so it's not an adaptation, let's say, but maybe, maybe one could argue that all architecture is adaptation as we assess the situations, the conditions of climate of site of uh, the people who use the even new buildings that we as architects produce. Um, so the building is big and it's new, right? But it also, you can see this little blank wall here, it provides a passage from its main street, which is 126th Street, south to 125th Street, which is arguably, let's say, one of the most important streets in African-American culture. So the way the building adapts to its site was all about where uh, it didn't build itself, let's say. Um, we have also worked in higher education, several projects from Cornell University. Uh, this is the uh, from the School of Art, Art, Architecture and Planning at Cornell uh, in historic Sibley Hall. Uh, the issues of adaptation were very uh, present. Um, this is uh, an adaptation project in Rhodes Hall, which is a 1980s building for the Computer Systems Laboratory and a distance classroom for the uh, Department of Operations, Research and Information Engineering above it in the same building. And then um, in Weill Hall, another 1980s building, uh, a departmental uh, renovation and adaptation for the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Um, this image is, I'm gonna roll through these quickly. Um, this image is of a, a soon to be completed library, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna really focus on civic buildings, particularly libraries this evening. Um, we're working on several of these. Um, we have done a lot of exhibition design. Uh, this is for a, a photographer in New York City's World Financial Center. And the piece establishes its place within the center through the use of a black disc that simply lays flat on the ground. Um, we work on a lot of pavilions. Pavilions are uh, extremely fun projects. They can be, uh, you can study, you can investigate many different tectonic forms, ideas about structure, ideas about site in particular. When uh, this is in an art park, uh, this project is called Zoid. Zoid was part of a, an ongoing investigation about the, the right trapezoid. Uh, this is called House of Trees, and you can see Chris's pavilion uh, poking out to the left here. We were neighbors. Uh, this is a mass timber, our first foray into mass timber, um, a mass timber structure that investigated a whole range of, of structural um, conditions, let's say. We work very closely with our engineer, uh, who is Brett Schneider from Guy Nordenson Associates. Uh, we have an ongoing conversation about the wonders of gravity and shear, and every project is an opportunity to discuss those. Furniture design also coming out of this Zoid study, if you will. These are simply, um, these are simply public seating in the Miami Design District um, of a similar form as the last two projects. Um, furniture design also has really fun uh, opportunities. Uh, the second monograph from our practice is called 13 Ways of Looking at a House. It only focuses on the house, 13 houses that we have designed. Um, the book has just come out, I uh, believe, last fall. Um, we treated the book as a catalog of an exhibition. Uh, look at beginning, some of the, the works were all site models, 18 by 18 inches square, and extended the project 
or let's say the projects of the houses by just the acts of determining where within the 18 inch square the models would be placed. So the act of composition continued into the models. Um, that was a little off screen. Um, and then of course the requisite professional photographs of some of the houses, um, which of course um, we love the photographs, but we're also really interested in comparing the 13 projects. So thinking about the diagrams that explain the programmatic uh, organizations of these buildings and lining them up uh, in, in random order or in a grid, in a line to look at the way the patterns that, uh, that the sort of domestic usage produces and then can be compared across them. Uh, these images are from a, a section in the book called Thick and Thin, where we uh, analyzed and compared just simply the wall sections. After these drawings, we did a series of more zoomed in details. We perhaps looked you know, right at this detail here where structure, cladding, uh, different hatches that we created to, to explain this idea of the wall section. Uh, as we know in our contemporary um, discipline, the wall section is made of so many layers, um, something that Chris and I were talking about today and we were ex explicating that. We also wrote 13 essays about issues of, of the house, um, things that are that explain our influences, where we, you know, projects that we've looked to, projects that we we learned meant a lot to us as we worked on the book. They span from architecture to art, um, a lot about film. Uh, so understanding the house as also not just an architectural act, but, a, but also a culturally produced and culturally understood endeavor. And I would be happy to share this 20% discount code with you shamelessly at the end of the talk. So back to adaptation. Um, and by adaptation, I think the term that we as architects so easily jump to is adaptive reuse. Um, but I think that, you know, that just sort of means maybe you re you change out the finishes, you'll upgrade the HVAC and, you know, you're kind of done. Um, but adaptation, I think it, it, it occurs at, at, a, at a whole range of scales for us to, to understand as architects and to inhabit. Um, and we're so interested in these in our work. Of course, I talked about the planetary, uh, the way the city adapts over time and changes the way we understand architecture. Neighborhoods are constantly changing and the branch libraries that are gonna, I'm gonna show you are all responding to the way neighborhoods change and are changing over time um, in, in New York City. Um, and then of course our buildings have to adapt. Um, at the larger scale of the cultural, we're seeing huge seismic shifts in, in, so, in social issues, social concerns, and obviously in environmental concerns as well. And these issues of adaptation as they bear on architecture are embodied in, in these. And the institutional is something I'm gonna talk about um, uh, going forward. And then back to the building, structure can be adapted. Program changes throughout a building. Uh, material, as we understand the use of materials, as we are trying to transition ourselves from essentially from the carbon age into something that's much more uh, adaptable to planetary and human health. Um, um, and then, of course, uh, detail, the adaptation of the detail in order for the building to perform and for the building to also look the way we want it to look as architects. And I don't wanna leave out the willfulness of our creative endeavor, our creative act that we as architects are involved in. Kind of referring back to or the, uh, the Earthrise image, uh, this is a, an image of, a, of an occurrence that happens around 16 to 18 days each side of the winter solstice every year in Manhattan. It's called Manhattan Henge. And when the, you know, when the sun rises, right along the line of the grid of Manhattan that's rotated 28 degrees or thereabouts to north, and the sun rises along what has been constructed, the city that has been constructed, this consciousness, let's say, of where we live, where we've built, how we've built, and the environmental forces that are playing upon us comes to bear. This is um, a figure ground image. Is it fuzzy? It's a little fuzzy. Um, it's of the metropolitan region of, of New York City. Highlighted in the darker shades is uh, are the five boroughs. 
and I obviously show this for context of where um, where we're working right now and where we're from. Um, and I want to really just getting into some numbers. Uh, this is what this the lecture format will be uh, going forward: is five branch libraries and one museum. Um, some more numbers to contextualize the library systems in New York City. Uh, you would imagine there would be a New York City library system. Well, there's not. There are three. Um, and there are 92 buildings. So just, you know, the libraries themselves, the branches and the main libraries in what's called the New York Public Library System, which includes Manhattan, Staten Island and the Bronx. The Brooklyn Public Library System includes 60 buildings. And Queens is 62 buildings. So you can imagine out of these 214 buildings uh, that have been built at different eras, uh, there's a lot of change that happens as the city changes, as buildings need to change, as the environment changes. Um, and we're kind of in, I hope it's still going on, uh, sort of a, we had a big budget cut recently, but we're kind of in a golden age of the resurgence of libraries. In 2015, the, uh, the de Blasio administration allotted uh, $300 million over the course of 10 years for libraries. The library systems also fund themselves to a certain degree, but they have to be, they, they operate through these budget, these budgets from the city. So we, uh, this is a little bit in the weeds here, but uh, libraries have sort of, you know, they've, they've risen and fallen. The Carnegie Age and around the, the early part of the 20th century was a massive literacy campaign where beautiful stately classical libraries were built. They're actually quite tall. In the 50s, a couple more libraries getting a little shorter. And then in the 70s, under the Lindsay administration, we kind of got this situation. They called them Lindsay boxes. And there's a whole sea of 8,000 square foot, one story boxes. And they, they have very little natural light in them. They're, they're, they're weird. They functioned. The city was a tough place in the 70s. And the buildings reflected that, that toughness where the city was at at the time. Um, these are the, and I'm going to talk more about, you know, this idea of like then re-emerging, let's say, these, these buildings and re-imbuing uh, re them with this ideas of learning and self-betterment. But these are the five neighborhoods of the libraries that we're currently working on. Uh, two are built and three plus the one are a museum are under construction. So this is kind of like, this is sort of a lecture about work in progress, um, which is why I'm so excited about it. Baisley Park. Uh, is a library in Queens. Borough Park is in Brooklyn. Brooklyn Heights is Brooklyn. East Flatbush is Brooklyn. And Red Hook is Brooklyn. And these are three images I'm going to show you that are the main libraries of each. So this is the, the, the Brooklyn Public Library main, uh, main library behind the Triumphal Arch at Grand Army Plaza. And this is the iconic um, 1904 Carrera and Hastings New York Public Library at 42nd and 5th Avenue. And Less stately, let's say, but no less vital for its population is the Queen's Public Library, Central Library. This, this picture uh, we took directly across the street at the bus station. So there's a you know, big, vibrant bus and market station across from this library. The, the, on the right is the, actually the Children's Library, a newly renovated. To give you some images of what these libraries are like, this is a, a, these are images from a project by a photographer from New York City called Elizabeth Felicella, who we worked with in the past, called Reading Rooms, a catalog of New York City's branch libraries. And you can see the day-to-day, -day, you know, the pencil sharpeners, the plants on the sill, uh, the plantings outside, the old buildings, the new buildings. Um, and now jumping back to the five, um, on the far, on the, the left, your left, is uh, the, um, the Brooklyn Heights Library, the smallest of the bunch. I'm going to explain it's, it's, it was an interim library. Um, the second library is the East Flatbush Library. The third is the Red Hook Library. The fourth is, uh, its plan belies its size. It's the largest one. It's two full stories above ground and one below. So it's about 18,000 square feet. And it is the Borough Park Library. And then finally, on your right is the Baisley Park Library. So jumping into um, Brooklyn Heights, the, the project is built into a, a church. Uh, oh, I apologize. I went too fast. The, these, are, these are images of the befores. So that's... Um, that's um, Brooklyn Heights, 
This is East Flatbush before. So you can see these sort of low buildings, not a lot of light windows on the street. Uh, this is the Red Hook Library, also, you know, rather low and tough. Taller is, is Brooklyn Heights, more windows in the 50s than in the 70s. And then Baisley Park, also a 1970s, 8,000 square foot single level box. Um, the East Flatbush Library is, uh, is finishing up right now. And um, we're very excited about this, the library. Um, it's a, a, a pleated metal facade. Um, these I have these figure ground drawings of each of the neighborhoods that you saw before, showing the, the neighborhood and the collision of grids that uh, where the library is placed. And it's a vibrant, vibrant Caribbean, African uh, American community. Um, many uh, people come from all of the islands of the Caribbean. Um, it's uh, and this is actually the Flatbush project, which is you know they're musicians, they're rappers from the neighborhood, and they created this thing called the the East Flatbush project. So this is about we had to learn and understand the the people who live in this neighborhood, and then back to that that uh, the before image, and then the interiors. Um, you know why do you need windows when you've got cheap fluorescent light? Well. You need windows and natural light is why. Um, and then these images are really significant. You can see the 1985 renovation. That was the renovation and expansion that I showed from the previous image. But on the left is the, the library about half, half the size from 1952 with windows open onto the street. So the, the city became tougher. And the ideas of, with these buildings need to be more defensible, I suppose, or defended. Um, and then so this is a, a rendering, an image of uh, what we propose, which is to open, to open these buildings back up to the street um, and to embody this idea, this connection between the community and its library, where they see themselves, where they see themselves uh, learning and, um, and, and operating amongst a whole series of communal programs that libraries now envelop. The second key thing in this library was the, was the addition of natural light. So north facing skylights, and this is where the adaptation, especially of facade and roof monitors come into play, um, which is how do you get it done in this library. The, these models show the central reading room uh, with perimeter spaces all around, um, virtually eliminating uh, needless circulation, let's say, and putting people in the collective space, if you will. Uh, the image on the left of the roof opened up, and you can see where these these six skylights uh, were running across the 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 reading room. Um, the plans and reflected ceiling plan of the same thing. And then um, I'm not going to turn this into a construction technology uh, lecture, but but I'd love to. Um, the, 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 I, I want to talk about how these buildings are built So, because this is a key part of adaptation for us as architecture. The first thing you have to do to adapt uh, a building to a new use, a new time, a new environment is to understand your host. So it's a steel frame building with a lot of uh, wood joists. And then in this image, these very tiny two by four sticks that are holding up the roof. So in a flat roof that's constructed like that with no light, the challenge is to make the library feel and look like this um, are the challenges. And we're, these are uh, pages from our construction document set where we're threading through existing steel with new steel and then posting up a wood frame skylight against better judgment, but it had to be done for budget reasons. But so we got it done. Um, and then, of course, th this image from our uh, the sort of the the framing plan of the in blue the existing steel structure and in magenta the um, the new steel that we had to put in and then remove uh, that what I call the two by four sticks that you're seeing here and that false work. So it was a surgery project, um, and we needed to understand where all those elements were. This is an image of that sort of that skylight monitor taking shape. Um, with the addition, the very first panels of this um, random uh, gypsum, that's an acoustic panel, keeps the sound down in the library, and then the completed ceiling uh, with that pervasive random pattern of, uh, of uh, holes in the acoustic material, 
a zooming in on, you know, the, the library had the, the reading room had a sort of a faceted geometry, but we were punching up uh, into uh, into the section. So resolving the facets. Um, and then, of course, working with carpenters to get that was uh, was really interesting. Uh, two weeks ago, going out to the library, finally seeing the bookshelves going in for the first time. Um, and then the other element was the facade. Uh, the many layers of the facade. It's a pleated metal uh, facade that we created uh, out of a couple of different panels I'm going to show in a moment. But this is kind of an important image for us, showing the new steel supported off of an, uh, the existing steel beam. So the the, the concerns about torsion uh, were were took a while for us to work out with contractors on site so that we could hang this facade. And then going to the left across the screen this way uh, was about a 40 foot span. So that was a large projection. And then of course, these are the images of studying what the way we wanted the pleats to look. And then, you know, our, our construction documents then, you know, uh, using 3D to show the contractor um, the forms of the pleats and the graphics that we are applying, as well as the the two panel profiles. So we 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 designed two profiles and then flipped them on the facade so that you could use only two profiles, but get four dis four different panels to then create a, a, an image of even more variation, uh, not just a sort of a, a straight corrugation across the facade. And then images uh, from the factory that we received. Uh, that was a pretty exciting day. And factory images. And then again, that image, the 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 sort of the the foil is still on the windows. We're waiting for it to come off and for the library to open. And then in that two weeks ago visit, the very first books. Um, it was a project that's been eight years, start to finish, eight thousand square feet. And here are the first books. Working with the city. Um, the, this is the Brooklyn Heights Interim Library. Um, the, 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 our adaptation was really about bringing light uh, into the, uh, the Our Lady of Lebanon Church. Brooklyn Heights is a very small little, little neighborhood, uh, very dense. Um, and then this is the church, Our Lady of Lebanon. So the challenges of how to put something that's interim that sort of felt permanent so that people wanted to go to their libraries uh, they were they line up to get into the library in the morning, um, but then also to respect its its host. And th these diagrams, I think, are quite telling. We're sort of shoehorning the library itself in behind the church sanctuary with steps leading up to the front door. But then for stroller and for uh, universal accessibility, a slightly sloped uh, ramp space around the back, which I'm going to show in a moment. It became significant. A before image, we did not specify those chandeliers. Uh, the very deep beams, which are really important to this project, because we were able to use them to bounce light off to the ceiling and illuminate the entire space like a dome. Um, and then, so this is a little model, a uh, very small model that we made of what we called the, the bookworm. Um, and so we were using a, a translucent material that transmitted light through the space. And you can see it here in this image, the, the worm wiggles through the space, enveloping a staff office, bellying out for the reading room itself, and then creating a small little children's auditorium and children's area, and then access to the back uh, back alley. And then there's, because again, because it was interim, we were able to convince the Landmarks Preservation Commission that we could simply paint like a casual sign on the kind of kind of crumbling plaster uh, of this back alley wall, if you will. And so, you know, the, these images of light transmitting through the worm uh, and to create a light-filled space and then bouncing electric light off of the ceiling due to the fact of these like 30-inch deep beams enables it to be feel uh, bright all day. And then the other part of this, that was a really important part of the project, uh, was to was to, because it's a library and there are books and text, was to go to a native son of Brooklyn Heights, which was the famous American poet Walt Whitman, and to take his poem called Crossing Brooklyn Ferry and to essentially drag out its stanzas across the 150 feet of the worm. So if you wanted to read the poem, you'd have to walk 150 feet and then walk back and start again. But that really wasn't the idea, although there have been readings of Whitman's poem at the library, the idea was to envelop the space in light 
and words and text and poetry. And here you see that the staff office behind the Whitman poem, the reception desk jutting forward, and then seeing through the words. So perhaps instead of reading Whitman's poem as he had intended it to be, you're kind of creating your own poetry as you read the words that are that are all around you. And then that rear view to the alley space. The Red Hook Library is the next one. Um, this adaptation really has to do with um, a whole series of environmental factors. The For those of you um, who don't know the Red Hook neighborhood, um, it's kind of interesting to see it in this figure ground. Um, the figure ground reveals where, and I can just tell you about it, where the water is and where the, the shoreline starts, um, as well as what's very, very important is are these images, these sort of uh, shapes here, which are the the footprints of the um, the second New York City Housing Authority buildings. Uh, they have these buildings house about six to eight thousand uh, residents. Uh, they were built under the 1934 Mayor Fiorello Laguardia's program, which which established the New York City Housing Authority, which is the largest housing authority um, in the country. Um, and these people care deeply about their neighborhood. Uh, we, we witnessed this and we spoke with them at our community board meeting. So this is this tough little building, um, kind of looks like a parking garage. We're along, on an intersection, but the door is pushed back. Um, so people really don't know that, many people in the neighborhood, they tell us, don't know that their library is there. Um, these are the interiors, again, you know, from that area era of the 1970s in New York City, not a lot of light on the inside. So maybe not a lot of aspiration. Um, the garden space around the library, rather disused and overgrown, that's an opportunity for us. But this is the history uh, of, of the library. It was a 1914 library that, uh, with its all wood interiors, that was consumed by fire in the 40s and was not rebuilt until later. But then Following fire is, of course, flood, and uh, in the biblical sense of Red Hook, um, this is the, the lines of the flood of Superstorm Sandy in 2012 that um, that inundated the neighborhood. Um, you guys are all about 5,200 feet here. Red Hook goes from about two feet to a high, high, high point of 14 feet. 14 feet was high and dry in the in the flood. The library was at nine and a half feet. So it was uh, not completely destroyed, but it definitely needed to be um, renovated. So this is sort of the operative section here um, that I wanna point you to. Um, this is what we determined, we found, this is the existing section of this building. Uh, there's a slab, there's a big girder, about 30 inches deep, and a series of T-beams, the parking garage structure that I talked about, I'm gonna show further seven foot oh and three quarter to the girder. So what happens in a flood is that the water comes in from the side. In some cases, there's wave action, not in this area, but still it's coming in from the side, obviously from the rising of the waters. It's also coming from the soil and coming up. That hydrostatic pressure under the, the, the building code of New York City has to be maintained, it has to be kept down. So our structural engineer, Silman, um, it advised us that we needed to put an 18 inch slab on top of the existing slab. So if you put an 18 inch slab on top of a slab, but your girders at seven oh and three quarters, you're not even gonna get hit in the head. You might get hit in the chin. So you can't get in the building. So we had an opportunity here. We had to raise a little. So we proposed that we raise a lot. Uh, so we went from, we are going from a seven oh and three quarter a nine six to the bottom of the beams, and we um, we are we're about to go into demolition in a couple of weeks. So our fingers are crossed that this is holding. But we're going to push that ceiling up to fifteen foot six to you know embody this sense of 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 space over your head when you're studying, um, when you're learning, like the like the great reading rooms did. So here's our ad adaptation plan. Um, that looks sort of like, we think it looks like a, like a piece of, like a slice of bread, um, which is inflecting inward, and but it's also looking outward. The sense of connecting this building back to its, its neighborhood, opening up the facades, <clears throat> 
for, for views all the way through from the street back to that garden space that I showed you the picture of. And then again, out to the street and significantly here is the positioning, the move, the moving of the door that's currently here to the corner, the main intersection in this neighborhood, the four streets come in to this intersection. And now we hope that everybody who arrives at these streets will see the front door at the very least and come in. This is the image of the, the facade with the T-beams again. And here they are concrete on the, on the girders, the very, very small windows. And then again, these T-beams, when we, when we came on site, we realized that you know, we loved the beams uh, and we wanted to maintain them. So this is the girder. These are the beams, and we're going to be lifting this building from the girders. We're jacking it up in the air, severing the columns, and then bringing columns back in underneath to raise this ceiling in order. And these images actually help show the kind of the, the resiliency of the, the, the plantings, the landscape that we're working on with scape. The, uh, the body of the building, the girders, the T-beams on top. And then this, the next thing in the project that I'm going to talk about is the wrapping, the, the, uh, the cladding of the building, which is brick. But the, this, is the, this is the feeling that we were trying to achieve, this height. And if you remember back to the images of the lowness, we're trying to get things up in the air. The books cannot be accessed at higher than seven foot O. So you can see that's where the, the girder was, and this is where we're moving it up to. And then these studies of the brick cladding. Um, the neighborhood is a red brick building. This is not a red brick library. It's a light kind of a speckled gray. Um, it's supposed to be brick, something you can understand the unit of. It has a human scale, but it is not a, a not red brick. Uh, we are, as you can see, we're we're creating a perforation uh, for sol for sun shading, as well as at the parapet to just keep the building light. It's intended to look like a woven basket. And here's our study of that basket. And then we ordered a small ton of bricks and brought them into our model shop and started setting them up and playing with them. And we realized that this brick, which is a concrete brick made of a, a recycled glass aggregate, came in three sizes, 15 and 5 eighths, 11 and 7 eighths, and 7 and 5 eighths. And we realized that you could buy setting them up and pushing this, the seven and five A's back into the building to tie them back in. Whenever you want, you can pop out the 11 and five eighths. No cutting of brick, easy peasy. So we pop it out and we make the perforated screens and the perforated um, parapet that are supported through stainless steel rods running through the, the cells of the brick. And you can see in these study images, the solid brick where we had insulated walls versus the perforated areas and the tiebacks that the rods go down through. This image is showing the, stain, the steel rods posting up for the parapet and down for the screens. Borough Park Library, how am I doing on time, Chris? I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Borough Park is the largest, as I mentioned, uh, two stories with a full basement. Um, it's in a vibrant neighborhood. Uh, it's within the pervasive grid of Brooklyn. Brooklyn's just a spreading grid. Um, and in certain parts of the grid, there's very little green. But there's a, there's a polyglot neighborhood, uh, Orthodox Jewish, Hebrew-speaking, Yiddish-speaking, Chinese neighborhood, as well as a Latin population. So it's this library, the largest of the ones we're working on, has so many different populations and different programming that it needs to provide for, for its constituency. And so here's highlighted in yellow and ringed in green is, um, is the library within the pervasive grid. There's not a park in sight. There's actually a cemetery like up, up there. Um, and so there's, here's our brick building from 1950, early, uh, early 50s. And the story, the tecton, or I should say the structural story of this in this rather blurry photograph is it's a concrete encased steel frame. So that's the frame that we have to adapt to. And you can see in these historic drawings, the very, very deep beams that span. We've got like a 45 foot span, clear span across the reading room. Um, which we were working with, but the really the main story of this library that started off as a very small like HVAC upgrade and maybe some windows if we can afford it, um, really started with what you're seeing 
this the discoloration on the brick and the kind of uh tarps that cover the parapet because the water has been seeping in uh, it's a concrete encased steel frame as i showed you but on the outside it was just brick and kind of a 1950s fabric that was uh protecting the the steel and you'll see in these probes that we performed to understand the condition of the the building that as we got deeper and deeper in we realized that we had a we had a building that you know was deeply in need of a structural uh performative and environmental and et cetera et cetera programming uh adaptation and so this is the the renovation before us um this is the frame in its idealized form <clears throat> And this is what we're working with. And so this became an opportunity for us to rethink the, the identity and the cladding of this building. So it's clad in glass fiber reinforced concrete panels uh, in a kind of a fluted and rounded pattern. If you'll remember the existing building image, there's a stairwell punching out. We were kind of smoothing out that geometry with the, the way that the curvature of these panels in an S curve. And then the, the front facade looking at uh, the kind of the, the large expanse. So opening up not only the south facade, but at the east facade going down that garden. So we're, we're working with uh, Elizabeth Kennedy architects who wanted me to, sh she wanted to show me an image this morning. I said, I can't, I want to spoil it for Chris. Uh, and then this, the, the cladding panels. Um, and then in our construction documents, designing, you know, understanding where all the joints are and most, or I should say very importantly, is figuring out how to make as many like size panels as possible within a facade that look that has variation. Um, we've done a pretty good job. Of course, we've blown it at our corners where they're quite tall and curved, uh, but we're working with the manufacturer on uh, on these panels uh, to to see how they hang on the building. So working with our structural engineer in these images to hang the uh, the GFRC panels and then really to achieve this environment, this sort of open light filled. This is the, the reading room at the front tall bookshelves because they have a big collection with four different languages being spoken at minimum in the neighborhood and then looking back to the brick uh cladding of the street and then here's the garden so on the east side elizabeth's designing this kind of green room we're going to have also like a uh, like a movie screening opportunity and a children's garden um this is the children's library on the top floor also with large windows looking back to that garden so tight spa urban spaces in new york city but where we can get green we're getting green and this is part of brooklyn public library's adaptation they were when we first started working with them they said no gardens we have no maintenance don't even try and so now we're hiring a gardener and we can talk about how to maintain gardens um these are just model shots that, of a model that we just made it's a 316 sequels a foot it's about that big um, and then looking into the reading room at the ground floor and the, the children's library on the second floor, again, with programming all around the perimeter, uh, framing that, uh, that, that main space and trying to, trying to represent this, you know, this sort of, um, texture of the GF, the, the glass fiber reinforced concrete panels in our, our facade images and the embossing within that concrete panel of a graphic about Borough Park Library. Baisley Park. Um, Baisley Park is a neighborhood. It's just north of uh, JFK neighborhood. And it's, 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 a, it's a really incredibly vibrant African-American neighborhood. Um, it's been kind of left, left behind economically. Um, but we have this opportunity through Q Queens Public Library system to, to kind of bring this library uh, into the 21st century and to re-adapt it, let's say, to its uh, its population that's um, growing and struggling with its urban kind of issues. Um, the library is, it's a brick library. Here's the Baisley uh, um, figure ground showing the, the, the library. In the, in the grid, there's Baisley Park, as you can imagine, the park is here. And you can see that the darker large, this is a kind of a busy commercial street a lot of commerce a lot of religious institutions along this this street and this is our our historic uh, image of this building after it was built you can see the in the in the current day 
Um, it's all about cylinders and roundness. The architect at the time uh, was was fascinated. They're, they they per pervade the reflected ceiling plan. It's like these crazy round things coming down from the ceiling. Um, there's a courtyard that we had been tasked. We didn't like being tasked with it, but we were tasked with filling that courtyard in to make a children's a protected children's room. We we resisted, but they were right. Um, and the other the other story about um, the Baisley Park Library is is this kind of brick that's been repaired over time, not terribly well, and was even compromised from the beginning. Um, this this whole along the side where you see the more orange brick is actually the garden side that's completely disused, and we are opening up that whole garden, moving the entry to this side so that you enter from the intersection into the plaza. Um, a moment of respite before you get into the library, as opposed to where it is now, where you're kind of coming in along the drum. So we're trying to take the the architects, uh, these ideas of the circles, and to reinforce them, and to make the geometry clear, and to and to and to make the brick uniform. We're we're working to make uh, to reclad the entire building and, and upgrade the brick, as well as to make brick a red brick plaza. So this place becomes kind of a red beacon if you will, in the neighborhood. Elizabeth is also designing the gardens uh, in this project as well. Uh, image from the, the main commercial street. And then the tech, the, the structural, the, the, the technical uh, uh, opportunities, I should say, of this building, it's just very, very lightweight um, steel open web joists uh, punctu punct punctuated with very deep steel beams that run alongside that that courtyard making it virtually impossible for us to move our ducks through. Uh, we're having a hell of a time with it, but we'll figure it out. So this is the structure of this building that we're then recladding in brick. Images of our model, we're trying to celebrate that lightweight steel ceiling. Um, the plan showing the, the, the new vestibule, the new entry, uh, the, the meeting room uh, jutting out into the commercial street, and then you know figuring out our brick details. Uh, how do you make, uh, how do you hang new brick? Uh, insulating the building uh, to make it a lead silver. Uh, all of these projects are uh, have to be lead silver. I forgot to mention that Red Hook is going to be the second net zero building in New York City. Um, it will it will use no uh, energy um, and produces. Uh, we're producing it with photovoltaic panels. This project will also have photovoltaic panels to um, make up for uh, certain. Uh, weaknesses, let's say, in its uh, in its current HVAC system. But then in this image, just celebrating that lightness of the ceiling and bringing light in. Here's the children's the children's room, about three quarter encased in this round glass. And then uh, we're covering the inside of that meeting room drum that you saw uh, jutting out into the commercial street. With uh, we're working with an artist from Ghana named Serge Clotty who makes these kind of yellow uh, constructions out of recycled plastic that come from the ocean. They wire them together and we're cladding the entire outside of the drum in, uh, in that material. Model shop, I think the bookworm from uh, Brooklyn Heights has returned. It's worming all the way around the building, making the backdrop of the library, the books, the knowledge is the, is the essential context of the library. Um, so here's the here's this is the last project I'm going to show, and it's the one in the five plus one. Uh, it's the Queen's Museum. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about its history and what it is, but I think these quotes from Aldo Rossi, uh, his uh, the architecture of the city from 1982, are really important about the way buildings change and the way cities change and the way things have to adapt. He says there are large palaces, building complexes, or agglomerations that constitute whole pieces of the city and whose function is now lo no longer the original one. And then he goes on, one is struck by the multiplicity of functions that a building of this type can contain over time and how these functions are entirely independent of the form. At the same time, it is precisely the form that impresses us. We live in it and experience it, and in turn, it structures the city. So form, we transmit these ideas through form. We have a lot of responsibilities in this discipline as architects. Uh, we have a lot of life safety and a lot of environmental uh, issues that we must, we, we, are, we are tasked with. We are, it's our responsibility, but we also have the responsibility of creation, creating things and transmitting them through form. And each of you and all of us 
are creative individuals who have the capacity for making these forms and for combining the technical and the things that have to address all different populations. If it sounds like no small task, it's no small task. And then this is a, I'm fascinated by this figure ground map of the Queens Museum because it's the inverse of all the other figure ground drawings I've shown you. Uh, in those, the buildings are compacted within their grid. In the Queens Museum, it's in what's called Corona Park. It's a park. And the park, you can see, is, is, is defined by, what it, by buildings that are not there. It is defined by buildings that are adjacent to the park. The edges of Corona Park are made up by buildings. But Corona Park has a scattering of very large buildings from uh, the Queens Museum here to the Arthur Ashe Tennis Stadium. Uh, Mets City Field used to be Shea Stadium is right here. Um, so these patterns in the figure ground reveal everything about the museum. So designed in 1939 by Robert Moses's right-hand architecture man, Iman Embry, uh, the designer of approximately 600 buildings under Moses, Robert Moses at this time, transforming the city. He'd work in any style, he'd do anything. Uh, but it's a stately building, kind of stripped down classicism, um, modernism of the 1939 time, but built for the 1939 World's Fair. And here's Aldo Rossi's quotes in action. The building keeps changing over time. Here you see the building and the north side, the what was called the perisphere, meaning you go in it with the uh, trilon, the, the obelisk behind. And then the building also housed the UN General Assembly in the 1940s before uh, in the 50s, the UN moved to the west side of Manhattan. Uh, it had a cafeteria and other offices that were to the north side. It was built and then removed, but the General Assembly was inside this museum. And then again, in 1964, the World's Fair comes back. Um, so in 39, it's a uh, world of tomorrow. And in 64, it's progress through peace. Peace through understanding. And I'm going to talk about the pair. This is the Unisphere, uh, which is uh, a, an open frame uh, depiction, representation of the planet. Um, in the 60s, uh, the, there's an ice skating rink that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the panorama of New York City, which is this iconic, oops, iconic uh, model. Uh, it was the largest model in the world at the time, it may still be, it's still there. This was this, you see the catwalk all the way around, designed by Raphael Vignoli Architects um, to celebrate. And, there, and under a two-year closure of the museum that renovated the interiors. And then again in 2014, Grimshaw Architects designed a, a light monitor inside, a series of other elements, and the uh, east facade. East West facade facing the Grand Central Parkway, and then current in its current state of vibrant vibrant programming. Queens is the is the most diverse county uh, in the country, uh, considered to be perhaps one of the most diverse neighborhoods or places in the world. You can hear 130, sometimes I hear 190. It called uh, said languages in Queens, people from approximately 120 countries. So the programming uh, is is um, reflective of this incredible diversity, all of these different people who come and use the museum. It's free. Uh, it was a food bank during the pandemic for families who uh, were out of work. Um, so this idea of the museum changing, before I go to that, the, the, the museum and the, and the whole idea of the museum changing from just a place to see art to a place for social engagement. Uh, and essentially social sustenance in the time of, of a pandemic is at play. Um, are isometrics uh, studying the grid of the building um, and understanding this sort of open framework that we were we were celebrating? And so uh, really quickly, I'm going to run through these. These are the three plus in one. So it's one project. It's the Queens Museum renovation that we're working on, but there are three plus projects. The plus on this side is the renovation of the South Facade. I'm going to talk about the preservation issues. One is um, the, the whole office administration wing number two is the um is the research um is the research wing and, and essentially archive uh of the museum uh including an auditorium and then number three is a museum inside a museum 
it's a children's museum that's, that takes up two stories. Um, so the plus is here, uh, the issues of historic preservation uh, and the need for the concept of preservation to adapt to adaptation uh, is, is central uh, here. Um, we've seen a lot of sort of rigid concepts about historic preservation where it needs to be exactly the style, but it's almost impossible to build the style with especially the environmental concerns and the social issues that uh, come to bear on these, these, these buildings. Um, the pandemic taught us that having opening windows was a pretty damn good idea. Um, and that's what we're doing in this, uh, in this renovation uh, or this preservation of the facade. We're renovating the glass block. You can see in this image in, the 19, in 1939, the glass block technology required a steel frame to interrupt it. And I, we've, in working with Silman, we've uh, determined how to actually remove that steel and the glass, the block itself uh, resists the lateral forces, uh, enabling us, we think, to sort of embody the ideals of openness in that architecture at the time, as well as creating opening windows up at the top in what are the, the, the walls of the children's workshops uh, that I'll show you in a moment, and then the loading dock, and then how we've kind of figured out, we're figuring out how to build this glass block while also having this bifolding uh, upward acting door. So in the number one uh, in the offices, um, there we're uh, and what you're seeing here is kind of our introduction into the museum of uh, cross laminated timber. Uh, actually, a, a whole series of CLT panels that create the partitioning system of the offices. So we're introducing this material that sequesters carbon. It's thick. Um, it has acoustic properties. Um, it is not made of a lot of layers. Uh, and we're we're interested in building with these materials that are that are thick and robust, and of course have these environmental qualities that have everything to do with the mission of this uh, this institution that is all about community, um, and we would then argue planetary health as a, and human health as a result. Um, the partitioning system, uh, and then the boardrooms, uh, you know, using the curvature at the four corners of the building, in this case, the boardroom, to uh, to have a Queens artist working in ceramics to come and to create a piece that backdrops the long, um, the long boardroom table, staff lounges using imagery from the World's Fair in the upholstery um, to, to make the, the cushioning of these systems. Uh, number two is another one of the meta projects. It's the, um, it's the archive and the, it's an archive and a library, but the archive is about the museum itself. So it is also sort of a meta project. It's it so inside the museum is a archive about the museum. Uh, be, and and what's so fascinating is the museum continues to change and evolve. And that archive and its library here is meant for scholars to come visit and people to come see the ephemera from the World's Fairs. Uh, so the archive is is an active uh, open. Uh, player in the library, the auditorium opening on to uh, the kind of the circulation system of the museum. Um, and then finally, number three is the Children's Museum itself. Two stories also using this cross laminated timber in different ways, and then opening up a fire stair using fire rated glass to make the sort of movement up and down uh, part of the activity of the museum. And then very importantly, uh, a, a big, almost room size elevator in the same color red going up and down that, um, you know, takes away the stigma of, of access, let's say, of uh, ADA uh, accessibility um, and places it right at the entry. Um, so not just uh, ambulatory people are welcome, but all are welcome to come up and down uh, in the museum. Children's workshops, again, using CLT, doors opening up, uh, playing with lots of uh, vibrant color. Uh, and then finally, the Children's Museum as a framework, a place where curators can, can uh, do anything they want. Uh, they, the uh, community can see itself in many different ways and different activities. They have a whole different, a whole series of programs that they're, they've talked to us about. And then a place to really frame the vibrancy of, of the cultures that that inhabit uh, Queens. And then so I'm going to finish on the Unisphere, 
uh, which is this constructed, you know, kind of starting with Earthrise uh, and our view of our planet from space, and then uh, seeing the, the the globe as a framework, let's say, where cultures revolve around it in the in the space of Queens. Thank you. Hi. Um, back to the, the you've shown us a lot of really beautiful renovations of library buildings. And I realize that part of the challenge of renovating or adapting these buildings is you remain within the original footprints of them. You can't really expand, you can't really. But I'm wondering if part of the adaptation has also been, is there any new adaptation of the program of the library? I mean, I'm looking at the plans and looking for computer rooms or digital archives or something. Yeah. But has the program for the New York Public Library changed? That's, uh, Chris and I were talking about this earlier. It's a fantastic question. And it's really kind of going back to the, very beginning of the lecture, this idea of institutional adaptation. Um, we're seeing libraries changing. They're so dramatic um, in their changes and in their programming uh, that making space in an 8,000 square foot floor plate for all the books that, by the way, did not go away with the digital revolution and a whole series of different spaces that have to do with social meetings, um, children's spaces. Some libraries have um, have classrooms for, for coding, digital coding to teach children of, of certain neighborhoods um, those skills. Um, there's tax preparation. You can meet with your parole officer. Uh, you can, they provide uh, summertime lunches for children. Some of them um, uh, are even, we, we almost in, in, we studied in Brooklyn, in Borough Park, um, a, a making center in the in the basement space. Um, so those perimeter spaces are all they all have different. They're very, they're very flexible those spaces because their programming changes dramatically. But we're, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a delicate dance of organization to make sure that there's enough space. There's enough space for the book collection. But you're you're exactly right. Um, you can see it on their on their their websites the way they talk about. Uh, the invitation of anybody into their libraries, um, and then the services that they provide. And with 214 libraries across the city, or I should even say 60 in BP, at Brooklyn Public Library, each neighborhood has, you know, they have different populations and different age groups as well. And they will kind of dial their programming to the populations, the age groups to a certain extent, and then, you know, position certain, like, again, making centers, coding classrooms into libraries so that across the 60 buildings they're providing for for these types of services i mean at a, at a very basic level we've got to you know provide for adult reading spaces uh toddlers tweens school age children uh like these these like micro gradations of of our of all of our ages um and then and then and then other things like uh borough park also has an arts and crafts room, and then a sort of every every library has a children's specific story time room, and a toddler's corral, and stroller parking garage. <laughs> Nail on the head. Yeah. Um, thank you. That was fantastic lecture. I I have a couple of questions. The first one I think is really essential. Uh, I just I have a hard time wrapping my head around the idea of an interim library. Um, I refer to an interim dean. <laughs> yeah. Library. And I, like, is it meant to be fairly temporary? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, I, I apologize. I didn't explain the kind of the whole condition around that. Um, Brooklyn Heights had a, a deco, art deco library that was beloved by the community. Um, as you can imagine, the, the budget pressures are enormous on these institutions, um, and they partnered with the developer, and they essentially sold the site to the developer to make a tower, but then to renovate the bottom two stories of that new building for the new library. 
Um, there was a lot of opposition. Um, there was a, it was quite heated. Um, we were sort of tasked with making this library that would that was would be in place for the span of time it would take to build that new building and then outfit the new library. Would it remain now? It's it like a, a, it's gone. I think it's gone already. Yeah. We built it uh, from start to finish within a year, start of design to finish of construction within a year, which in, in New York yeah. City time is just warp speed. Okay. So it was like, the design was like, how does it feel light? Um, but then how does it still be a place? Um, thank you for asking the question. I, I apologize for not kind of framing that. It's a weird city thing. Yeah, I think that the library has the space has been given back to the to Our Lady of Lebanon Church. I'm I'm sure they're better. yes, cool. <laughs> better light and hopefully um, crossing Brooklyn Ferry poem the poem is still still there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then the other question because there um is this the model maybe no that's not the the drawing class. yeah. Well, Oh, I'm just I'm just wondering for beginning architecture students in, in terms of your sort of process, um, in terms of like thinking about um, in your question about the digit, digital change in the program of libraries and also the change in kind of tools for architecture, um, the relationship between drawing, if you could talk to the students a bit about the relationship between drawing and modeling. Yes. Because these are, I mean, these are so beautiful. They look very polished and finished. And maybe the idea of process. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a great that's a great question. Um, you sort of got a little glimpse uh with the brick, the, the image with the bricks of like the paint cans and stuff like that in, in the model shop. And the, the shop is <clears throat> there's kind of one whole wall of shelves that we call the boneyard. Uh, and it's where, I mean, there are models and there are pieces of models that we've had for years and years that just we can't get rid of. And a lot of them are quick process study models. Um, I mean, we we designed a house once where we like, you know, we we're working through a series of designs and, you know, kind of casting about in the woods. And we sort of made the, like the gnarliest model out of foam. We just sort of cut up into a thing that looked like a Chinese throwing star. We built that house and 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 it looks like a Chinese throwing star. Uh, so we go from these crude, crude models, uh, then of course into, you know, how do you, how do you plan out that space? How do you, how do you occupy that Chinese throwing star? And we then, you know, make the spaces, you know, and we, we talk with the clients and we see how it suits them. First of all, do you like a Chinese throwing star? They loved it. Um, and then how do you, how do we live in that? How do we inhabit it? And then, and then the process becomes more and more refined. The models get much larger, uh, cause we want to enable, uh, are, we want to enable people to see into them. I mean, it's an, it's an amazing thing when you, the difference between showing people drawings and then putting a model on the table and just like literally like everybody just like they lean, literally lean into that model. They think about themselves in that space. They zoom their, their own personal scale down. And, you know, it's a physical fact. It's the first physical fact before the, you know, you add water and it gets big. Um, so, yeah, they go, I'm showing the polished um, models. Um, we love making those polished models. We've just, you know, we've got like you guys, we've got, you know, laser cutter, 3D printer, um, some, you know, kind of really simple woodworking machinery. Um, so the, the process is from kind of like crude and loose and, you know, a little bit wild to a, a process of refinement. But for us, the models are, they're just absolutely critical again for engaging our um, our uh, the, the people who will be using the buildings, um, and for ourselves to kind of understand the physical fact of the model. We totally we tell lies with renderings. Oh man, you can just tell yourself stories because you know you're changing camera angles to see more of this, that, and the other, and so the models are really where you just you can't hide. Yeah. 
Yes. So then you look at, do you think that because a lot of the work you have public constituency, meaning you have to um, sort of calibrate representation to different audiences, mm. do you find that the, the model, physical model itself is the best means to do that with? <clears throat> it's so interesting. We're, um, different representations at different times do different things and are needed for different things. Like we're about to go to the, uh, we went to the gala, like they do this gala every year. And it, and it was, it was mind blowing. I mean, it was full of, um, you know, Queens based artists, fashion artists, musicians. Uh, I mean, like I really gotta, I gotta up my, my sartorial game. Um, and we're going again this year, uh, I think it's in a couple of weeks and they've asked for images. And they've asked for, you know, these. And so they'll, these will be, you know, up on screen and they'll be flashing. And, you know, so in that context, um, you know, the image is part of the, 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 the atmosphere. Um, but when we go to meetings with the directors and the curators and the directors of educational, the educational programs, the librarians, director facilities and all these people, the model, you know, sitting on the table um, is really where, where everybody, you know, gets in. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think, well, actually, I, uh, Borough Park was a project, again, the, the two-story library. It started with a very small budget. You know, we have some windows that are leaking and, you know, the HVAC needs upgrade. And we, Stella and I had this huge argument and I was like, let's just, let's just make a big model and show them a vision. And um, we decided to do it. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like we, we built it. And then, and we also showed them, of course, that the steel frame was, was rusting. So between the fact that your building literally was in, in peril of disintegrating and, you know, hey, could we maybe think about, you know, the interiors and then, you know, what would, what, what it could be. Um, you know, we we're we're uh, just about we're we're delivering 100% CDs um, this summer. So, you know, that model, which was, it was a quarter inch, it was a foot, it was a big model. Um, we were able to, you know, put it out there. And you know, sometimes you just gotta you just gotta kind of go for it. And you know, trust me, we've done it before, and it's just like falling flat. Like, yeah, that's nice, but. I'm not paying for that. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, it's a really important communication tool. I think you were talking about how to get um, duck work through that courtyard, but I heard ducks, and I think we should have ducks. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, how do you get ducks? Yeah, yeah. How do you get the, how do you get the ducks? Well, the, actually, the Basley Pond right behind the library has ducks. Ducks. Yeah, yeah. The, this was all about you know taking what we first thought was a, a like a, a dis opportunity and turning it into you know a space that we 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 love and you know is going to be full of light. It has proper solar shading, so it's not glary. <clears throat> so did you figure out how to get the ducks in there? We're we're actually that's in D, uh, DD and we're about to go into CDs and um, I know that like the I know the pinch point and we'll we'll figure it out. We'll you know there's some some sleight of hand. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks everybody. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>